Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahedo Bible Study Podcast. Today we are in Malik the Johannes, or 1 John chapter 1. We have exited the Petrine literature, and we are entering the Johnine or the Yonin literature. This is a subject I have taught on many times, so I'll attempt to keep it brief and maintain my focus on the text itself. As a reminder, this Tawahedo Bible study and the larger Ephesus School Network have an emphasis on action. So my call to action in the beginning is always for you to subscribe, whether you're on Transistor, Anchor, YouTube, Apple, or Spotify, wherever you're listening to this, make sure you subscribe. That allows the maximal amount of listeners to be able to find this program and it helps to uh, move towards uh, independence in this scholarship. Make sure that you're also sharing it, whether it's the ideas themselves or links to these recordings with your younger brothers, younger sisters, younger nephews, nieces, even maybe your older aunts, uncles, grandparents, strangers, and enemies. Make sure you donate if you can, and you feel the conviction of the Lord at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash tawahado. So before I get into the verses, a little bit of an introduction to John and the Johnine literature. Amongst the Ge'ez right, as well as the Greek right, I learned about the Greek right from the archpriest Josiah Trenum, and I know about the Ge'ez right from my own parents and the life they they lived, but along with all the priests I know as well. So both of them use this text of First John 1 as an instrumental test to learn the old Greek or to learn Ge'ez, basically to learn how to become literate. And the reason is that First John chapter 1 are just 10 very short verses, which are very friendly and easy as an introduction. If you know anyone and they're just in a state of paralysis analysis, meaning they want to start reading the Bible, but they don't know where to begin, a lot of times I recommend First John 1, and that's part of the tradition that I come from. So in the traditional school, right, which really doesn't begin modernizing until the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s till now, um, the way that you learn how to read and write is you go to a local priest who's in your neighborhood, and that priest tells you how to read this. Usually, you know, he's falling asleep half the time in the average case because he has a system very similar to the Japanese Senpai Kokai system where he's got about two or three main students that he's really impressed the, the teaching on. And those students then impress the teaching on, on the rest of the neighborhood kids. And whenever they make a mistake, he steps in to intervene. But other times he's empowering them to, to go through the texts on their own. And there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of recitation or, or reading out loud of the texts. And that's the primary way in which people learn how to read. In fact, the, the word for reading, both in Greek and in Ge'ez, means not to read selfishly by yourself, but to read aloud, to read publicly, as Paul tells Timothy to commit himself to the public reading of Scripture until he returns. So we have to also remember with the current politics going on around right, around right now, um, the literacy is not in Amharic, the literacy is not in Tigrinya, the literacy is not in Afanoromo. The literacy of the traditional school of the Ge'ez right is in Ge'ez. I even have Muslim family friends who wanted to be literate during the time of the monarchy, and they learned in the same fashion by reciting 1 John 1, and then the Gospel of John, and then the Psalms of David in three different melodies that the church prescribed. And that's basically the preschool and kindergarten. People who go beyond that stage will enter into a form of super humanities and get their equivalent of a bachelor's, master's, or a doctorate in any given field of study and continue. That's a story for another day. I give you, without further ado, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Today I'll be reading from the New King James Version. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. 
the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ and these things we write to you that your joy may be full so the fullness of their joy is found in this homage to genesis father paul nadim tarazi repeatedly emphasizes to us that genesis is a transliteration of the greek name in the original hebrew bible we hear genesis referred to by the opening words and the opening words are not in the beginning in english but bara ashit bara elohim and translators translate that most commonly as in the beginning but you can find people like the independent scholar jeff benner who would say well but ashit bara really means at the summit and he points to the resh which is this semitic cognate in gez amharic and hebrew which means head so it could be the head or the head of a hill the top of a hill a summit or it could be in the beginning but to even entertain any of these translations you have to go back to the beginning and read barashit bara elohim in the original which is of course the biblical hebrew in any event john here is encouraging us to use our senses he doesn't quote all five but it's assumed that an invitation to all five can be asserted and the invitation to get all five of your senses to be feeling are often talked about in the services of the orthodox church so here you are called to have sight hearing and your tactile or touch all submit unto the lord so the apostles have seen something they have heard something and they have touched someone they have become witnesses in the greek the word for witness is indistinguishable from the word martyr because ultimately you give witness unto the ends of the earth until death and when you lay down your life for another that is how you express that there is no greater love not with your lips but with your actions by laying down your life and finally here we have this great greek word kinonia which in various versions can be trapisa fellowship or table fellowship or simply fellowship or communion or a participation or a sharing it's about the unity of the brethren and the sistren verses 5 to 7 this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship there's that word again with one another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin god is light pope shinoda the former head of the archbishops of the church of alexandria one of the original apostolic sees planted by the apostle mark who is a direct disciple of the patrine and the pauline church of both the apostle paul and the apostle peter of course the indisputable top dogs of our lord and savior jesus christ so pope shenouda from that lineage of blessed and hallowed memory had this book on comparative theology and when he talked about god he gave us the illustration of the candle i wish i was with you in real life right now i've demonstrated this point with the candles in our liturgical service before as a prop to the children of my local parish but i'll try to be as descriptive as possible with my words if you take a candle and look at the light the fascinating thing about the fire and the light of that fire is that you may see the shadow of the candle but you will not see the shadow of the fire and that is a great analogy or illustration or parable or mashal for god who is light and in him has no darkness at all and it is through his son and through the blood spilled one time that we forever 
have something that cleanses us from our sins. Glory to him. Verses 8 to 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Ladies and gentlemen, beloved brethren and sistren, it's quite simple. We have sins. We have disobeyed. Father Mark constantly reminds us on his program that we are the villains of the biblical canon, of the biblical literature, of the biblical narrative, of the biblical story. God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. He is the sole hero. He is the sole protagonist. And to this protagonist be the glory and the dominion and the honor unto ages of ages. Amen.